smaller steps of how to realize this future and this vision of building an OER university network. So um, we'll be taking report back uh, from each of the groups and the, the kinds of recommendations that the, that the groups are putting forward for our general discussion and you know, deciding the next steps. And I'm very pleased that uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Mr. Rory McGrill, will be uh, facilitating the session and then I can prepare my feedback. Thanks, Rory. All right, then. Good afternoon, everyone. I would, uh, it is my pleasure to call on group number one to present their report to the other groups. So group number one, who's the volunteer? We've got a volunteer. Please train the camera on the volunteer. <laughs> um, okay, well, you know, life's never a simple thing, even though we're getting them into what might be turned into smaller pieces, and we had to walk a little bit backwards before we move forward. Yep, that's right, that's the one that I think. Um, I'm looking above number one, because we had some preliminary work to do. Um, and one of the things, and I apologize, I haven't really uh, wordsmith this yet. Uh, we first of all had to discuss uh, our approach. And uh, here's a few bullet points. And I'm just going to pick out points here and there because I'm sure I will take too long and then we'll I'll just have to stop halfway through. Um, so we uh, recognize that somehow the course needs to be deposited. And uh, one of the things we were holding in the back of our minds was what you demonstrated yesterday with Wiki Educator and the link in from Wiki Educator into an LMS such as Moodle. Um, but that wouldn't be the only way. It was just what we are envisaging. And those courses would, would be deposited in a location like that as OER. Um, and the LMS wouldn't be in OERU, it would be in the individual institution. And that the mentors might create another freely accessible space, location, whatever, cloud. Um, I can't even think of a see a show <laughs> of issues. Um, and the recognition uh, of courses as comparable would be comparable or equivalent. We'll come back to that later. So, uh, if you like, the contribution of two courses per partner institution uh, is a long term, and some of them may be very short term. Um, we had some discussion around, uh, which was revisiting some of yesterday's, about uh, <coughs> what we meant in terms of programs, the language, if you like. And we thought that our longer term objective was therefore an undergraduate diploma. Um, equivalent to the first year of a general degree. That's just to try and keep it in generic terms. Um, and also some postgraduate or graduate uh, courses that would be suited to uh, develop capacity in tertiary uh, teaching or higher education within and in coherent <coughs> with the OERU. So that's where the, the programs are. We started off thinking that maybe this had better be limited to three courses, but we went away from that. Um, and so we'll come back to that later. Uh, but we do, uh, and another group will come back to that robust assessment and quality assurance, but we did uh, think of some of those. Uh, we also recognized at this stage in particular that there are institutions in the partnership that have roots. And those routes are already there, so we don't need to find additional routes at this stage of how to do uh, prior learning assessment or even challenge exams and things like that. And it wouldn't mean that all partners have to. It just means we have that capacity. And so some partners would be offering or dipping into or something like that um, courses but not providing the assessment. Uh, we also recognize that there are institutional registers or credit banks which are really saying this is equivalent to that. So there are benchmarking things, uh, databases if you like, that we can call on um, in the future. 
people are going to interrupt me if I get the wrong saying anything wrong, right? <laughs> um, and we thought at that stage it might be nice to have more um, uh, OER new tools such as an e-portfolio. Um, not essential, but nice. That's why nice has been used in there. And uh, procedures such as the requirement of some government identity and other processes. So these were us just giving illustrating things. Then we moved to tentatively identify uh, potential courses within the partnerships existing around that table. Because one important principle that we need to keep coming back to is what fits with the principles, the purpose of OERU. And so that's why these ones are profiled here. Um, and we also discussed a peer review uh, potential process for the first year. And we also said it was only the first year that we would be thinking of this because these courses are going to go through a trial by fire, if you like. And we need them to come out bright and shining on our end. And it will also be very good for um, the institutions and the staff involved in the review to learn more about what others <coughs> have experienced through developing the course and presenting this design. We do assume that all partners have quality, and that's why it goes through this. Okay, so we didn't get a narrative. We then came to uh, an understanding that indeed there are plenty of OER courses out there. And maybe one of the early offerings should also be something that is out and is repurposed for OERU or adopted by or whatever um, as one of the things to try. So it wouldn't necessarily be from the partner institution that would be offered. Um, and um, let's see, we also needed to figure out who the students are that this would be marketed to and for, and um, to, to figure out a little bit more. Uh, yesterday we talked about the Commonwealth of Learning um, uh, International, <coughs> International uh, International uh, for looking at courses and programs internationally. We need to, we, we recognize that that's something that needs to be worked further on and that um, Paul might be invited to help us with that. So, um, we hope that another group has been very clear about identifying the value proposition for the OERU and what it is that we are marketing. But you can see in some of what we've said that it's becoming somewhat implicit, some of these things, the principles. And in addition, what we identified was that the, there isn't the, the mentoring by students or by others, volunteers, isn't just about getting them through a course. It's also about advising and helping them navigate through um, the OMRU. And that's a very important part of all of our institutions. We have advising and student support services, and that needs to be thought through in some detail. Now then there were things. Objectives, therefore, in the short term, uh, were reinforcing maybe a diploma of general studies that would scale the case to a bachelor degree, and it would include processes that, for example, the BC campus Canadian Virtual University and other partner institutions have already worked out, so that helps us, um, that it would underpin, uh, other courses would underpin <coughs> the development of OER new practices, including the design, mentoring, and advising, and uh, that there would be trial courses in that in the first year. 
What do we need? We think we need to pull it in the OU, OERU wrapper. I mean, we need something <laughs> that's on the web that provides uh, a way of communicating this. Other tools underlying that. And we need principles of engagement that underpin those processes. And we need principles of design that fit with the value <coughs> proposition. And you've thought about this elsewhere, which is the answers. And we need to find some target clients that will help us do the trial that work within this. And so uh, a couple of courses that we think that might be good places to start might be something like a Targo Polytechnic's sustainability course that they're thinking about uh, and have offered. Um, and also the US do digital literacies course. Um, because they address some of the audiences that some of the students we hope that the OERU aims to serve on an international <coughs> level, I think that's all I've got. So that means anything? Did I say a lot of rubbish on that? That's our Thank you very much. I'll open it up for discussion. We're going to have a discussion before yeah, we yeah, go to the next group. Brief discussion. It's yes. kind of an open question I've got. I, I, I think, let me put it this way if, if I had to draw up a proposal, that's exactly what I would table. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I, mean, I think it's just brilliant in, in terms of what's coming together. I mean, there are a lot of pieces we don't know the answers to yet. But what is out there is a solid foundation to work, work with. <coughs> Suggestion, and uh, it's an open question what about the third alternative? take one of the existing course. I know it's listed earlier on, but maybe the third prototype is taking a solar foundation course or something like that and integrating it into the model as a suggestion. And that's was it we just did we would need to go there and have a look. And okay. I think also we would need an advocate um, within the consortium sure. to want to do that and spend the time on doing it properly. Yeah. Well, that's the thing that concerns me. I think it would take too long. I'm not against the idea in principle, except I don't think it should be part of the prototype because it would demand some form of accreditation, institutional process, and an investment of a fair bit of time. So I think we need to be you know, fast, flexible, and fluid with terms that we used to talk about to try and keep us focused. And, I don't think that would be the, the quickest thing that we could do. And I think going back to the KISS principle, you know, keeping it simple, I would like to see that as a second option. And it would be easier to move with existing partners. It's yeah. my personal view. And I, 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 I should be with you, Jim. Um, I, I mean, I think we've got to divide this between short term and medium term <coughs> as, as well. Um, because after the first prototype, you know, conceptually be a second prototype. In the following year to improve what we did the last time around. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So we are in agreement with that. It goes back, I think if you look in the context of it, goes back to, um, you know, if the OERU wants to be seen truly as leaders in this space, um, one of the places to show leadership is in the notion of not um, creating things for which OERs already exist and being a uh, true leader in the reuse of open education resources that are already there. So that was the context in which that suggestion was made. Could I, uh, I mean, if you scroll down a bit there, the, the description of giving support and everything, I mean, we already have that. That's what we have. If we have a system where you pay and we give you support. And I was, my view of the OERU is that we don't give any support. We just, you have the OER and you do it on your own and we take the exam. We already have a system where you pay for tuition and we couldn't give support at the cost that we're trying to bring it down to the one quarter the cost of our tuition. We couldn't provide support at that level, so I'm, I'm a bit no, confused. I think what we're, we're not talking about support at that level, at the <coughs> level that you would get as an enrolled student <coughs> in a course and in a program. We're talking about the fact that we've already had another group working on student volunteer mentors. And what we're saying is that we understood that they thought their role was just to do with learning. We're saying there's a bit more to it than that. There's also advising. 
and advising for what the OER do, can do, and what it can't do. But this is an added cost. But, but in a way, that, that wouldn't add cost, number one. If it added cost, it would need to be a, a, a service provided by one of the actors, and it would be recovery services. Well, I, I'm just trying to see what what the difference is between what we have already and how much of our resources we're going to put into that and then where it makes sense financially for us. Okay. Rory, is it you're thinking that the academic volunteers are provided by the institutions or that there are people who volunteer at no cost to the institutions? Well, we wouldn't have academic volunteers at this stage. We'd have to go through a huge process because we would have union problems with that. No, I mean in the OERU. Yeah. Even in the OERU, if, if it's our course we're accrediting it and, and people are doing that, um, student volunteers I think could work, but uh, academic volunteers would be a big problem. I, um, it's not insurmountable. Um, we'd have to we'd have to work on it, but in the short term I don't think it's viable. But of course, for those who it is viable, then go ahead. That's fine. Yeah. That's, uh, well, these people were. Um, suggested in the same context as the academic volunteers who were seen as being people who volunteered to support the students at no charge to the student or an institution yeah. working through their materials. The only difference here was the suggestion that the students could probably also use some assistance through volunteers in how to navigate their way through OERs, um, uh, putting together learning portfolios, those sorts of things. Again, at no cost to the student or to the institutions through volunteers. Okay, I take it back. I get, I get it now because if they're volunteers, they're not our students till they take the exam, so <laughs> we have no control over it anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah. 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 More discussion. I was just wondering what <clears throat> was intended by the comment about principles of design that fit with the value proposition. Um, <clears throat> OERU is about increasing access. If um, the courses actually don't do that, particularly in the early stages, then we're, uh, I suppose, standing over a thing. Um, so one of the things I think that we sort of discussed yesterday or became implicitly clear to me yesterday, and even before then, was that we were going to have to think about evolving some sort of an open pedagogy that we promote um, as being a more equitable approach to higher education. Not that everybody has to do it, but that would be one of the things that actually helps OERU to <coughs> practice what it preaches. Okay, I, I think probably there's some, and I, I agree with that, but I think there's some divided opinion here that might be worthy of more discussion, maybe not now, but down the road, because um, there's also the approach that every institution would be responsible for its own uh, design. We were talking here about first on. Yeah. And so it was about this first stage, and the first stage we should start at least on the right path. And so if we decided to if you like, start on more of a, uh, something that didn't clearly fit with OERU, then we are possibly not going to end up early in. Because maybe I should clarify that, because from what I'm reading, it's, it's the, the design that doesn't refer to the learning design, it refers to the design of the program, if you will, as opposed to the design of the learning experience. If you see what I'm saying. I think they're two different things. True, but I think it's a bit more than the learning experience because we've already mentioned advising. Agreed, and that's what I'm saying. This is not the pedagogical design. Yeah. That design. Am I right? I don't think we thought that far, to tell you the truth. Yeah. So, okay, <laughs> I mean, I, I, to me, it's everything. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what I'm saying. Yeah, if we could volunteer to do that, that would be great. And Sorry. <laughs> okay. I have my own naturally act session here. So uh, I'd like to uh, uh, request of the uh, second group to uh, give.
give a report? Do we have a volunteer? Uh, yes, indeed. We, we have a, a number of volunteers for Academic Volunteers International. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what we did, we, we started with a couple of leading questions to help, help us think through what this might be. And I think there, there are two very important guiding principles informing what we're trying to build here. One is you can't tell volunteers what to do about the very nature of you know, what volunteering is. So from that perspective, it has a significant implication for how you would potentially design a system like this because you have no contractual agreement with the people that are volunteering. Okay. The other uh, approach is, uh, we realize that and this is not necessarily simple to do, although once we went through, we actually saw how easy it was. But um, we recognize that there are complexities sitting in here and that we're not necessarily going to get it right in the beginning. And the approach that we're going to be adopting is an incremental kind of agile approach, step by step, and every time it will iterate and we hopefully will get better. Because we're drawing on the open source uh, model, which basically says, you know, we give you the software that you are free to use and adapt and modify and do what you like with it and we hope you find it useful, but we don't provide any guarantees. So similarly, we're going to try and build a system of academic volunteers, which is going to try and do amazing things. But obviously, you cannot necessarily in an open community guarantee the quality of what the, that support is. So it becomes a, a community model. So the kinds of questions we uh, were, were asking are, well, who potentially could be providing volunteer work in, 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 in a large ecosystem? Um, one of the points we made out that, and uh, which came up quite strongly, is that these volunteers are not necessarily subject content uh, you know, facilitators as such. They, these volunteers are people that can support the learning process as opposed to actual content related issues. Um, as you know, an idea which came up. We also note, or noted that the system could rely quite considerably on students as volunteers. And there are two potential uh, sources of volunteers within a model if you're trying to build a sustainable ecosystem. One is that we could have a scholarship model where students are provided free assessment services after, say for example, providing volunteer support for key courses or whatever the number is. That is one potential model. Um, so from an accounting perspective, there's no cost to the institution, and the institution's not necessarily losing much. Uh, the other uh, idea we had around students was uh, the practice that is emerging around the world around community service learning, where within your degree program, there is a community service learning course which you would get your three credits or whatever the credits are in that system. And one of the ways you could earn credit or part credit for that course is to provide volunteer support in an environment like Academic Volunteers International. And so we would have systems in place technologically that would actually monitor the, uh, the kind of uh, support and time people are putting in and the quality of the support that has been provided through the volunteer network. We also see that there are, there's a potential opportunity here for academics who through their normal uh, staff appraisal systems report community service as a form of recognition for staff appraisal within the institution. We know that this doesn't typically count much in the staff appraisal, but you know, if it's you know, 5 or 10% or whatever it is, um, this is potentially a vehicle to formally uh, say, you know, here I've volunteered time, it's been measured, you can see the quality, there's a, there's a, a feedback loop there. And if I understand that Empire State College, a number of colleagues, I mean, you would be to, expected to sign up for certain sort of community stuff. And I know that at Empire State College, a number of colleagues have signed up to help the OERU as part of the community service. So really, we've got an operational model of how this volunteering can actually work. Uh, we also believe that uh, there's a strong community of, or a strong resource among retired uh, you know, academics 
who would love uh, to actually be part of making the world a better place. Um, we also believe that there is a, an opportunity if you build a scalable and sustainable economic model, we can provide a baseline level of support for paid facilita uh, facilitators. Now, how this would work, not a cost to the institution, but you build up an, an honor system based on gaming theory where people earn karma points within the larger network. And one of the ways you can generate revenue is for someone to actually buy out karma points as, as a donation model, that you want to actually donate $20 to help save the planet, um, but you haven't got the time to donate. And that funding source can actually, because we are a non-profit, we, 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 we can do this kind of thing, we can actually then use that revenue source for your first baseline a level of support. I, mean, I don't like the analogy, but it could be the call center, if you will, of sort of the OER university in, in a virtual environment. Of course, we can uh, draw on existing communities uh, who, uh, by the very nature, provide this kind of volunteer support. We then ask, you know, well, what do we see these volunteers doing? Um, and, and, and the first brainstorm ideas that we bulleted were this notion of um, that volunteers would actually facilitate peer-to-peer -peer learning support within the network. <coughs> in, in, in other words, helping learners, uh, you know, to you, you utilize the peer-to-peer the -peer support that is out there in the community. Um, generic student support uh, in terms of you know helping to uh, find you know find the right learning sequences, uh, you know, the utilities, for example. We then uh, started thinking about uh, the song notion of criteria for selecting volunteers. And again, it's problematic because you can't tell a volunteer what to do, and you can't tell a volunteer whether they qualify or don't qualify for volunteering. And it's just an interesting problem. So what you have to do is you have to build up the model through community. Uh, as the model evolves, community need to decide how you select and uh, you know, develop karma points for your uh, levels of proficiency or whether there's a badge system in this volunteering work um, has to be developed by the community. Uh, of course, ideally, volunteers would need to be culturally sensitive in an ideal world, but uh, we will see how that evolves. So, um, you know, other issues which came up clearly uh, and, and on a system. Um, I mean, we conceptualizing academic volunteers internationally as the kind of the social network in inverted commas space, because it could be multiple spaces, uh, you know, on the web that supports OER, uh, OER learners. Um, we're thinking here, and this also comes out of the, the free software sort of support experience, uh, is a layered permanent model. In other words, this whole notion that you only want uh, you know, 80% of your problems must be sorted out um, before it reaches the 20% of the volunteers kind of thing, of your, your dedicated volunteers. And so how the pyramid might work is that the first level of support is a database, an intelligent database that you can ask questions, um, which could then guide them to peer-to-peer -peer support and help them to get to that point. Um, and, and then support from academic volunteers. So we're only getting 20% of the problems filtering through to the volunteers, so we want to filter out most of the problems before they get there. And then, of course, you've got the OER University guru, and you know, this is really guru status in the community. You've earned your stripes, you've you know, got your track record, and you know, ultimately to get to the guru, you know, state, you know, to guru them, you really know what you're doing, but gurus can really sort out any problem that, that may arise. It's again, you know, it's an 80-20 rule. Anybody that is taught in a classroom knows that 80% of the questions were asked last year. And uh, you know, it's just the of teaching. And so we can actually automate that a lot of what we do. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, our our longer-term aim with Academic Volunteers International is to develop a financially sustainable system for Academic Volunteers International. So the thing can be self-supporting. Um, the shorter term medium objective is to nurture the development of the critical mass of volunteers that you need for the self-organization and scalable growth of the model to actually start functioning. Um, 
we also are thinking about well, what kind of resources do we need to build capacity for volunteering work, you know, e-moderation, um, how the system works, and that sort of thing. So, I mean, I think I've basically covered, you know, what we're aiming to do is to really, to an incremental approach, taking small steps, is actually start building the model to get to the point uh, where we want to be. Um, we think we need to develop from a user perspective a number of use case scenarios of what the support might look like uh, in a volunteer environment so that can help inform the selection of open source technologies and any development work that needs to be done to make the system work. Uh, we think that there, there might be some funding necessary to get some code development done to really tweak the system for our needs. Um, we need to, over time, design solutions on you know, how do we recruit, uh, how does the self-selection model operate, uh, and then the community can help us build that. We want to trial the model with the first prototype. Now, this doesn't mean we'll have everything in place, but we might select a number of aspects of academic volunteers international that can, uh, can you know, start testing the ideas. Our uh, decision proposal for the partners to think about um, is that we uh, would like to take a decision to draft a framework proposal for academic volunteers international that will be considered by the academic uh, the OERU anchor partners by the end of the year. So we develop a framework model proposal and table that um, you know, for consideration and hopefully approval by the partners. Of course, this will be an open process. Any institution or anyone who has an interest in this area is uh, most welcome to join. And we're very thankful. We already, the volunteering is, is working. Uh, Farsi has you know, volunteered to convene this group. And uh, we, you know, Graham and uh, myself have agreed you know, to, to, to help out here. So we're off to a good start in terms of volunteering work. So that, that's where we're at. Further discussion? Any volunteers? <laughs> I just want to note that we have a couple more oh. jumping up and down online. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when do you think there's a critical mass at the target number of volunteers that makes us viable, given sort of? It's, 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 it's a very good question. I, I think we have a number of uh, open experiences to help inform what that number might be. Mm -hmm. um, this sounds like a political response. Um, the, uh, to be realistic, the, the way that we're going to know what the critical mass number is is by actually piloting. Because then we can use uh, simulation models to actually simulate what the critical mass is. But you kind of go and, I mean, you don't know how many service questions are, are going to be asked. I mean, we just don't have that data. But going through a prototype, we, we will, the system is going to be a self learning system. In that, I, I think, yeah. And then we can use a dynamic simulation modeling to actually see, well, okay, we now know that the critical mass of this is you know, 4,000 volunteers or whatever, whatever that number is. But the interesting thing is for that prototype, we, you know, we will populate the model, say among like anchor partners, uh, because we know that this is a fixed number of students that we're thinking about, let's say 100 prototypes. So we can then populate the model in terms of what we think the categories are. And obviously, in the first instance, we won't be able to have student volunteers necessarily, other than peer to peer support, because the system hasn't matured enough yet. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mark. I'm yeah. just saying goodbye to Mark. He needs to sort of thank you, Captain. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When uh, was there any looking into giving students uh, um, release on their next course if they mentor? Yes, there, uh, there was. The recommendation is um, what the exact number is going to be, um, but that they could get a scholarship um, for a course uh, if they provide support services, say, three other courses, for example. So that it is included. But what the actual numbers are, we don't know yet. And the mechanics of how that might operate, it, we're not sure. Because then, you know, do you ask, do you do it on a refund basis, or do you do it on, you know, we've got to think those things through. We haven't gone to that level yet. Yeah. So. Further discussion? No more volunteers? Did, did you uh, talk about the advising side of all you? In fact, we did. I, I, uh, I thought we, 
I may have skipped over it, leaned over, but we actually did. We took you know, sort of this career path at advising at service. Um, we, we do have been included. Um, to be honest, I don't think it will be in the first prototype because it's not much advice for me on my course. <laughs> but, but we have been included, yes. Yeah. And, and of course, it might be useful to look at models like, for example, um, small businesses have quite a lot of senior business people and paratrooper advisors and that sort of thing. So, um, looking at what they plan for success might be helpful. The other source that we look at, which we try, was contacting professional bodies um, because they've got an interest in getting their business, whether it's CPA or whatever it is involved in higher education and we wrote a number of uh, letters just prospecting as it were and we were pleasantly surprised by a number of people who were positive about it and some people to retain their professional membership have to do certain projects continuing education type um, maintenance and that was another source that I'm sure we get support from and we also asked them about um, advertising the model, as it were, as projecting, you know, doing an article in their professional journal about the OER initiative, and they were quite happy, not in all cases. But I think once we get it organised, that will be another source of support and engagement. I thank you very much, and I've added both of the excellent suggestions. So. But wasn't it George Bernard Shaw who said professions are conspiracies against lay people? Why would they they try to keep people out? That's why they exist, isn't it? I think every every professional organization feels threatened by uh, pressures of institutional finance and you know, by the new world as it were. So under engage. I see up there it's like for retaining membership and that's what we find is professional bodies are very eager to work with us uh, uh, for uh, uh, training of them who've already got their degree yeah. uh, but uh, they are very reluctant to find easier ways to get the, yeah. the professional certification. They, in Our fact, they're looking always looking for harder ways to it. Yeah. Our experience was that they were predicting there'll be a shortage of accountants, a shortage of this, a shortage of that, a shortage of engineers, and anything they can do to get people looking at their discipline or their area, that's how they respond to it. So it's probably a balance. Yeah. I've got another question for the group, and I'm, it may be in too much detail, but um, if we took a, a nominal 100 students per course, which you mentioned, um, I was looking at what a student support, staff student ratio, volunteer ratio might be, and what expectation in terms of time, you know, might you expect from a volunteer, so that we wouldn't just have one volunteer on each course who's doing a sort of surrogate tutor role, but we have a small team working together, so that they might agree a schedule where they'll do, you know, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We didn't talk about the, the detail of the numbers. Um, part of what we want to do is with the framework proposal is to actually start thinking through some of those um, those things. And what we'll do is, you know, in discussion with anchor partners, you know, just put a number on this um, and get you know, because we know it's 100 students and we'll try and tweak it. Because what we want to try and structure this is in a you know, to map against the pyramid. Because there are different levels of support and the different kinds of support that happen. Uh, because we've also got to think in terms of the scale scalability issue and in terms of how. From the data we get that, I mean, what, what are the implications for scale? Yeah. Now, just one brief further comment. Um, last year we ran a, a focus group among retired mm -hmm. academics, this target group that we had about the project and whether they'd be interested in whether how much time you know, would be prepared to give up. Um, most of them were interested, thought it was a great idea, but they didn't have any time because since they retired they were so busy. You know, <laughs> doing other things. It, it may have been just a, a small group, but that's why we got on the thing that we need a guideline and say, would you be prepared to give an hour a week? Or something like that, uh, two half hours per week, and 
not been making it more meaningful. So we have, I mean, it's, we have quite a bit of experience from the wiki educated community in a number of related projects, um, you know, like the data model competencies, and you've got an idea in terms of what your time commitment is, and I think it's a very good point. If you actually tell a person be, to be, you know, be an ABI at this level, we expect taking one hour a week to do the following things. Are you able to, you know, to commit to that? Um, and you would have different levels within the system. Yeah. So, I mean, we're not going to go to that level of detail today, but I think it's a, to, to make it operational, and we're leading into the project plan now. I think what we're trying to be is do it quickly to meet the funding guidelines and other things. So, I think the process is to get started. You know, we've got by the end of the year to. You know, collate that. I think that's a really useful. Well, we, we didn't think um, for the pilots it would be a problem. We we find plenty of people who would help us Just test the system. Start. But but the way the discussion went, those concepts around case loading and hours per week became almost irrelevant because it was very much a self-regulating um, point scoring badging system, whereby you know in effect the the students themselves would select. Facilitators from um, from within the the infrastructure that we had, um, and the number of um, students who would be supporting being supported by a particular uh, facilitator would almost become a dynamic um, arrangement that may have more than one facilitator, for example, very much demand led. So those sort of concepts became almost irrelevant in that model. Mm. I can understand that if it was up and running, but I think to get started, we need some guidelines and standards. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, because we'll need, uh, and, 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 I, and I have a strong suspicion that anchor partners would contribute um, to uh, ABI to, to, to an extent, right? Mm -hmm. Just to help us model the process and get, get the data and the like so we, so we can model it and something. The other thing which is very interesting with Academic Volunteers International, I think we all collectively agree that the better ABI is, the better the learning experience will be for the learners. But I think we also need to be very realistic in terms of our principles and what we are trying to achieve. This is not a critical path issue. In other words, what, what I'm saying about that is if we don't have ABI, the model of being able to provide more affordable education is not going to derail. But we can do it better by having a good system of ABI which then helps feed the ecosystem. And, and that's why I think an incremental design learned by doing the approach is going to help us, you know, help us a lot. Just a clarification. Um, do volunteers belong to individual institutions or OEM? Uh, 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 they belong to anybody. So some institutions I mentioned, like Empire State, who will in staff in their staff appraisal community service for academic Just as maybe a final comment, I think uh, the significant departure from the original model is whether or not volunteers have content expertise. And the original conception, based on a parallel version of what happens in our normal mainstream environment, I would think that volunteers with content expertise in certain areas would be very helpful. So I wouldn't like that to go off to the agenda. Um, we are talking about e mentoring rather than e moderating, where there is an element of um, sort of content expertise that will be relevant. So I don't think we need to discuss it, but I wouldn't like it to drop off the agenda. And I think, I think it's included in the model, uh, it's not specifically stated, but as the community grows, people will gravitate towards the areas of content interests. 
kind of how to organize the system and follow it. Is it in response to the last question, who owns them? I think they are, you know, owned by a course or a, a disciplinary, if you like. That would be how it would operate most effectively. The people who get the peer tiered services, they would self identify the way they want to actually volunteer. Okay. So some people might want to volunteer to provide math support. Um, online and, and something that we've discussed throughout is the fact that we're relatively imperial uh, in terms of our language and also that we need to make sure that indigenous peoples are enabled for self-determination. So um, that is a, a really essential aspect. And while we're not discussing it all the time, uh, I think we need to mention it now and again. It's, 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 a, it's a mission critical area. In fact, the group, we, we, we did discuss this mm -hmm. point with the group. And our, our, our response at this point in time is we, we felt that uh, it is uh, multilingualism and, and culture is significantly important in addressing the world's concerns around access to education. Is there. But in terms of how that gets resolved, there are multiple approaches. One approach is to have OERU to try and resolve that as, as, a, as, a, as an umbrella, right? As an international umbrella, that might be one approach. Uh, it might not be the right approach. The other approach is to mirror what the OERU network is perhaps doing in other languages and other cultures might be another approach. Uh, what we did say at this point in time is we don't want to introduce a layer of complexity into resolving the model, but just from primary experience of working in multilingual environments, they are extremely complex and it's extremely tough to get right. And, and, and so at this point in time, it's very anglophone, um, but the very nature of the problems that are around the table. Further? No? Okay, I would like to uh, request the uh, group number three volunteer to Volunteer away and start uh, volunteering. Yes, you're okay. group four. I thought we were group four, but I guess it wasn't a group three. So. <coughs> Maybe group three. To provide. <coughs> okay, so we were looking at the um, basic project management of uh, OERU um, proposal. So um, I don't know if Wayne got my elements mm -hmm. up. Do you think you uh, which one did you use? I emailed them to you. Oh, okay, okay. All right, no worries. My apologies. So, so under longer term aims of the activity, we had um, clarify and develop levels of participation for founder members, allowing us to meet deadlines and have appropriate inputs. So in terms of the project management of this, if we consult 20 people 500 <coughs> times over minutia, we're not going to get anything done. So we will have to develop a system where we'll have sort of reporting, which will sometimes be to inform you where we're at, sometimes to consult you where we're at, um, and obviously certain people will have responsibility or accountability for elements there. It's, it's fairly standard project management. Um, we'd like to think longer term, we're offering a proof of concept prototype, a small number of courses, which I think we heard from another group, that will enable students to get credit before the end of 2012. That's the target that we uh, looked at. This will involve scholarships for pilot students. That was a proposal that we had in our group. Um, so obviously part of the project management is the timeline, so we feel we need that um, as a sign-off so that we can map things to it. Um, and longer term end of the activity, final point, assessment of learning outcomes and development of a formal review process. We've talked a lot about agile development and just-in-time and beta version. Uh, with the concept that you know we want to get out there, we want to get in market, and it will then be continual improvement and uh, iterative development. <coughs> so in the short term, <coughs> excuse me, we need to um, get the context and input evaluation started to design the prototype. We need to develop a system to keep the project moving in a steady time frame. Um, we probably will use some project management documentation that we'll certainly put up to the wiki. Um, the goal is the whole process will be transparent, although of course, as I say, if we have um, 20 people with veto authority on, on every decision, <laughs> uh, we will get there. So we, um, in the short term, want to make sure that any project planning aligns with any documentation around funding proposals so that we're not reinventing the wheel or being redundant. 
um, and some of the uh, funding I think is mentioned elsewhere around <coughs> next gen. There's a February 9th, 2012 deadline for the next generation funding, which we'd like to align with um, and look at other possibilities like Hewlett, etc. Um, we think early it would be great to engage quality review standard bodies, um, input evaluation needed, get an organization in early to review the project, perhaps a small steering group needed for that as a slightly separate um, yet connected element of the project management. And we had some names and acronyms, uh, suggestions for that system-wide review and overarching quality framework. Um, so in, in a brief narrative, um, work on project documentation that clarifies deliverables, ownership and deadlines, clarify point people at each founder member, package these materials to present to a foundation or some possible funder, develop a prototype to be in market for fall, autumn 2012, full launch, fall, autumn 2013. Clarify all roles on the project team, which should be multinational, multinational and multicultural, and at each institution. Um, our suggestion is that we perhaps have three people, three or four people on the core project steering committee with a named liaison person at each institution, and as I said before, all documents to Wiki uh, for transparency. Inputs required, identify identification of point person of each institution, a formal list, the institution, the steering committee, the liaison, the representative. We've got a sort of basic tab table mocked up that we've got certain participants in, but there are lots of gaps there, so you guys will have to fill those in at some point. Um, timelines, launch date, and market date confirmed. Um, review of project plan and documentation, and a list of courses for pilot, pilot which we were hoping we would get from it was group one or group two. Um, so 1.5 decision proposals for OER 10 partners for this activity. Um, we need commitment to the timeline, launch date, etc. We need identification of the liaison representatives and our ability to contact them. Um, and we agree to present to specific foundations. And I think that's on this afternoon's agenda. Um, we did have some underlying principles that didn't really fit under bullets, but we thought we would record them just because we could. Um, so we endorse the principle of institutional autonomy and context-specific applications within the guidelines of open governance and open management. The models have to be scalable. The student experience has to be learner-centered. Total learning system must be considered, push towards an outcome-based model, accountability for active engagement. Um, we did have some other critical questions around what exactly defines a course. Are the materials standalone, or can you only access or study the materials as part of the college-specific course? I think that's come up in a few discussions. Um, and we must develop this to speak to social justice, yet be sustainable. That was the um, social justice versus profitability aspect. Affordable access to education is, is obviously the goal. Um, I think that's about it. Um, we, we raised the question that Sailor Foundation were mentioned around not reinventing the wheel and institutions who've pulled together already reviewed, uh, somewhat quality assessed uh, materials that are out there. So um, again, in the interest of the reuse aspect of OER, that we should look at those and um, try to avoid reinventing the wheel. Um, threats over elaboration in the planning stage, lack of consensus over project goals, could lead to an amorphous product. People have to engage and refine as we go. Um, perhaps we need a chart. That was it. Discussion. Wasn't quite clear on the um, deadlines you said there. Full um, or it's easier perhaps to suggest a month. Um, in relation to bathrooms full. Um, who's autumn? Oh, four. <laughs> okay, so are you, are you sort of talking <coughs> about October 2012 to be finished so uh, and be December 2012? September, October, sorry, I'm a, I'm a Brit living in America, so I struggle with a fall <laughs> autumn thing. Um, my concept would be September, October 2012. As the to end that? Yeah, to offer. To be in a position to offer at least two courses. Yeah, and it ends where? It ends when where? When does the pilot end? Whatever the academic period of study is for but the pilot. But, but the pilot has to make sense of that in time for you to do something before you launch after that. 
Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm unclear. We had with the end of December, end of 2012, yeah. by which time the students would have had an opportunity to gain credit. So, so the start so date would be you know, a few months before that. So not thinking of any full year courses? No, it was a semester. I was it was a semester, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then to fitting in with the next gen uh, proposal, if we did manage to get some funding, they have set a deadline for all in US all in, uh, 2013 to launch. So we're back from there and hoping that we have enough time to, to get started if we start more or less right now. Mm -hmm. Further discussion? Not discussion item, but just to say I, I will upload the documents in the wiki and, and alert everybody to where they are. Um, it, it's not going to happen tomorrow, <coughs> but uh, early next week is uh, very likely to happen, you know, time track for that to happen. So you will have access to all this documentation. I, I would like to uh, <coughs> stress the importance of using the OER that are out there. One of the big criticisms from the major funding agencies is they're not being used and there really is no excuse for it. Yeah. And we keep making our own stuff all the time and we think that's the way you do it. And that is the way of uh, making uh, the OER uh, movement uneconomical and uh, it just doesn't make sense. The only way it makes sense is if we start to use and reuse uh, what's available. So mm -hmm. there is a huge amount available so we're encouraging you don't develop a course. Uh, look what's out there and use that and accredit it and uh, uh, make sure it fits your standards. Uh, that is more important to us than you developing your own course. Yeah. And, and Rory, I, and I would go as far as to say that it's, it's something we should perhaps consider as a principle of engagement within the network that uh, it's a guiding principle. We always start with what's available. Yes. As, as opposed to doing anything else. And if you don't want to do that, then it's something else and then you do that with all yeah. operations. The law would be things that we always include any institution from using the yeah. <coughs> within the mainstream program, if you see what I'm saying. Yeah, mm. yeah there'll always be gaps that need to be filled. Mm -hmm. and yeah. That's what we want to do, is fill in the gaps rather than reinvent the wheel. Yes. I, I just wanted to clarify something that Group 1 talked about that kind of addresses some of the points that Group 3 brought up as far as assessment and um, crediting and things like that. And um, in our discussion, um, the first question was, <coughs> if a student is taking the course, a course or a study program or whatever we want to call that, um, there is an independent study. They're not really being assessed in the course, or they would be paying for the course as the students who participate in it from the institution would do. So they're <coughs> not being assessed at the time they're taking the course. Um, what became clear is that at least two of the schools that were sitting at our table, BC Campus and Athabasca, have policies where they will give credit for an individual course um, with a fee schedule. So a student could take a study in OER, OER course that's available and then and build a portfolio while they're taking the course and then submit it to um, at the Basker or BC campus and then get actual credit for that course that then could be transferred to another institution that's part of OERU for the ultimate credential. So that would come with the, the cross credit piece. Um, so I think it's kind of important for us to have that those steps clear. So when the student begins the course, they would have a list of criteria from whichever institution they actually want the credit from so that it could be transferred to their ultimate credential if that's the method that they choose to do. They would not be assessed while they're taking the course because they would not be an enrolled student. That's correct. Yeah. So I just, yeah. just wanted and, and to make I sure think, that was clear. Yeah, that's correct. And I think the model is sufficiently flexible that for anchor partners who may not be able to 
or where a course doesn't quite fit all anchor partners, that there could be multiple pathways through this network, if you see what I'm saying. So being an anchor partner doesn't necessarily mean that you have, you have to agree to all courses being cross-credited and cross-transferred. But what we've got to be very upfront about is those which are, and that those pathways are very clear to the learners. And, and, and why, why I say that, because it's how, we build, it's how the ecosystem will build it. Because the institutions that are more flexible and have more open policies will be the institutions that will be able to recruit the most students. It's the fact of life. You know that I think the important principle that came out during our discussion was <coughs> the principle of um, institutional autonomy and context-specific applications because even in what Rory says or what Alan said about not being assessed during the course, I can foresee um, opportunities where it would be part of the course cohort and wouldn't have to be a single assessment of the portfolio. I don't think we're tied to that. You know, I think if an institution wants to operate in a certain way for a particular course, in a cohort-driven semester-length uh, operation, then they should have the freedom to do that with OER, and they manage it. So I think institutional autonomy arose this morning quite strongly context-specific applications emerged as an element of that. And in our group, it was mentioned that on the arena at the University of South Africa, that they would like the opportunity to translate the course into a local language and operate it you know, in their environment, in their context. And I think that was a good example of a context-specific application that was still part of the network uh, and they would have the opportunity to do that, but it wouldn't be something that would be referred back you know, to the governance or management of the operation. And that is implicit in the, the freedoms which the OER provide by the very nature of what we are. Yeah. And in relation to that, I think the end point we came to was that it would be useful to have a charter, uh, you know, guiding principles, whatever, some of which are implicit at the moment. And as we work through, I think we should, in defining the identity of our you what we are, what our value proposition is, that we work on a document like that. Yeah. And I guess, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, I guess a bit of a different stream there, but um, is, I, I'm just wondering, is it our understanding, and are we clear that no matter what structures we build around supporting and offering these courses, that, that as, as Group 1 said, that they're all deposited, and apart from what we do or set up, Anything can happen to them outside of that. <laughs> and anything can come back to any institution yeah. um, regardless. Yeah. I think the, the operating word is that this is open. Yeah. Is people can do what they want. And that's the beauty of the OER. Do what you want with them. Experiment. And we'll be looking at each other to see what works and what doesn't. I think that that's, the, mm -hmm. that's a, one of the main strengths of this whole initiative. And I think the interesting thing is whatever we do that way, it'd be interesting to capture that as well in terms of what happens. And that more difficult to capture what goes on in that, on that side and of the equation. I mean, this is why models like Wikis are so powerful. I mean, I mean we can set downsides as well, for sure. But it's the strength of the even if we're using for planning, and it takes a bit of learning to how to structure this thing, <coughs> right? but you, you, everything is documented, and it is so transparent. You can, you can see the whole sequence, how it's happening. And, and, and that knowledge and learning can potentially become classic knowledge and experience for everyone, including people outside the network. And, and, and that, in, in a sense, is, is very good for us as a network because it ensures a peace at the end of the game. Uh, because every, everybody else is looking out. Uh, we run open data meetings. We see that anybody in the world has an interest to participate and participate. Yeah. Further discussion? I, I just feel that the way that was described um, earlier and I think was, was very clearly explained and maybe we need to diagrammatically show that as well so that we're, we're showing that we understand the difference between a 
conventional learner journey and the learner journey that we are yeah. trying mm. to present. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that might be quite powerful. <coughs> The, the other thing that, um, if we've got the time to look at, is uh, Kevin mentioned the table of contacts and the concept of a, a core group working on each, say, the eye which we've got, and then uh, a contact person from each part of the institution who would act as the liaison and contact point for that operation. Is it feasible to get that before we leave today? You know, that we could say, uh, at least identify that I think one group had a convener and, you know, and other supports. And just to follow on from, from Jim's comment, this of course can be the no point FTE contribution from the organization as part of the gold membership, you see? Because each gold member is allocating a no point to full time equivalent. So that resource can, at this stage, the prototype, that's what the resource can be. For example, and of course everyone is free to donate and add more. We are a volunteer group. <laughs> are the people representing institutions here today in a position to either nominate themselves or nominate another person to just create this network of communication network before we leave today, just to save some time? Because I think we time is short and. You know, by the time we get back and Christmas is upon us, so it would be, you know, losing time for a start. In addition to that, I, I think what we should maybe just do is to set up a simple anchor partner contact email list. You know, on we we'll run run a lot of our own, own, own lists, so that everyone in your institution that has a, you know, that's interested, you're a site that we enroll into this dedicated so site. General OER university list. I'm talking about the anchor partner list. Mm -hmm. So that any communication that happens that is important for our plan related to OERU activities is, 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 is in that list and, and it will be open, people can see it. Uh, but they've got those points of contact. And, but what I wanted to ask for is your permission to have the people who are here today as the first point of contact on that list just to set it up. And then should you want to change that data in the future, just to let us know that, that, that I, because then I don't want to just subscribe to this without your permission. I think that's one issue. The other is the sort of matrix of logic model initiatives, say academic volunteers, and the core team and the contact person is so we know who's running what, and if we've got any input to make any thoughts, we you know, forward it to the convener because if we're, I agree with the generic list that we've got, but we can become inundated with communication and we may want to focus on a particular issue in terms of priority for time. So I think it would be useful if we could somehow identify, you know, conveners or institutions that will be in the lead logic model initiative. And we had some suggestions for that in our group, uh, but it was drawn from people within the group. I mean, that was where we were interested to go and talk, so it may be a good thing anyway. So if people would endorse that, I mean, maybe before the end of the afternoon, we can informally you know, put, a, put some suggestions up. You know, we, we had a convener structure. I mean, are we have to endorse the ABI, convener, you have to endorse our group suggestion. There's actually four people who nominated to, to help with the um, project plan and liaising in terms of work on the funding. I mean, it would have to be tied together. Yeah. And what we'll do is we'll also tie them up logically because, for example, the convenership and that, that needs to be on the project management mm -hmm. activity. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So we just got to That's get that alignment. Right, yeah. the, if we can get there this afternoon, it would be good. And we've got a person who's happy to start work on the, the context and input evaluation and more systematic collation of, of issues and structures and inputs once we frame it up so that that can be systematically presented. And um, I know we, we were in, I was in a position of 
this goes and staying on the table. Um, we need some form of endorsement. So the other thing is, how do we do the open management of this? The open governance was one thing that I think would help in trying to move quickly. You know, I, as I think, as Kevin said, if we have to refer every decision to everyone, it would just probably stay. So <coughs> I think, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think the issues of open governance are a little more complex to resolve in, in, in a short time. Because I think we need to, as, as a group of partners, to look at what two or three different models of open governance in terms of how they work in different communities to get a better sense. And that we can, as a community, decide um, which model is going to work best for us. Um, because there are two or three very distinctive kinds of models we could use. I wasn't meaning that, I was just saying as an aid come this afternoon, can we have in you know, conveners and doors? Have you shared with us your list of no, your group, or are you going to share it? No, well, uh, we did record it. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's went oh, no, I no. it's in my email. It's, I'm, I'm the give uh, oh. person here. There is a list of names there. No, I was expecting it would take a while. I mean, we've, we've got some names in for our institutions. I've, I've set out. So, so what I'm going to do during the tea break, I'll, I'll get that uploaded. Oh, okay. okay. And so can we do the same for each group? You know, we've got ABI with the first group pass. People who would focus on the issues there. You know, the convener focusing in on actual outcomes that are going to emerge from that group. We need to go back together again to, yeah. to, to sort that. Yeah. Just, Rory, I'm just going to record the four minutes time, I'm going to wrap up. But I, what I do want to acknowledge uh, is the very rich discussion. And, and, and list of suggestions which have come from the virtual and open community. Um, you know, we won't be, I mean, given the, the wealth of discussion that's taken place here, uh, you know, I'm scrolling through, through this. Um, it is a very, very rich document. And, and Judith and I were actually reading through a number of these uh, comments as they were being submitted. And the parallels and levels of consensus between, for example, what Group 1 was suggesting and what was happening here, I'm not sure to what extent there was interaction between the group here locally and what was happening uh, through our virtual group, but um, I do want the virtual folk to know that we have received all these comments and we will collectively be working through them as we develop the documentation and we invite all uh, the, the folk who participate in developing the virtual community document to check that the proposals we've been putting on the table have at least considered uh, what you've tabled, and then ultimately anchor partners will then decide uh, you know, what decision they have to take forward. But so, uh, you know, I do want to express our thanks to this very rich uh, contribution. Uh, close her down for yeah, we cup of tea. tea. Well, I just felt that seeing as you weren't taking a break, I felt a bit guilty about us. <laughs> 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 and we reconvene at, at, at 3 o'clock. Thank you. 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 Thank you.